morning, everybody. Sorry, let me get my slideshow going here for a moment. Um, Professor Thrillkill, did you want to make any announcements first or anything, or do you just want me to jump into it? Um, I guess one thing I should say, first of all, thank you to Paul Blom of the Department of English and Comparative Literature. Uh, he taught this course with me last year and just gave such an interesting presentation on trauma, war, and masculinity that I invited him back and he said yes. So thank you to Paul. Um, don't forget uh, recitation today and you'll work on close reading practices. Take it away, Paul. All right, cool. Well, um, welcome everybody. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Paul Blom. I'm a fourth year PhD student here at UNC. Um, my research focuses on 20th century American lit and its intersections with health humanities, especially literary trauma studies. Um, and as, as Professor Threlkill said, I gave a version of this lecture um, last fall. This one will be a little bit different. Um, but uh, I should also say, I should mention, I'm, I work with one of your TAs, uh, Kylan, on the Carolina Quarterly as well. Um, so I want to say I'm recording this class session. I'll share the recording with your instructors after class today. I'll also share these slides. Um, and included in the slides will be a few that we might not specifically talk about, but I'm just going to include them anyway because they have some supplementary material. Um, all right. And again, since I'm recording this, don't stress over like trying to jot down specific quotations, anything like that. You always have these to go back um, to to refer to. Feel free to enter comments or questions in the chat. It looks like we've got about 51 people here. Um, I'll pause periodically and kind of check and monitor and address those. If uh, if you're calling in and can't use the chat function, when I pause, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, and actually, I'll go ahead and ask um, as a way to kind of double check or or add to the records. If everybody can just, if you're able to use the chat function, go ahead and enter your name in the chat. And that'll be a, a maybe a backup way we can kind of know who all was here um, when class started. Um, all right, I see that populating. Um, while that's happening, I'll also mention there'll be times when I'll uh, ask for volunteers to um, either read or comment on a passage. Um, I think maybe the simplest thing to do if you want to volunteer and kind of digitally raise your hand, maybe use the Zoom controls. You can add a reaction. Um, and you can, um, yeah, add a reaction to like put a thumbs up or something on your screen. I'll try to monitor that as best I can. Maybe um, Kylan and Stephanie and Professor Thrillkill, if you can kind of maybe help me monitor for those since I won't be able to see everybody all at once. Um, all right, so looks like the chat's slowing down. Um, okay, so it's my understanding that by now, everybody, you've all finished reading Pat Barker's novel, Regeneration. And I know you've already had a lesson kind of on the introduction to trauma or the history of the study of trauma. So today we're gonna to talk more about the novel as a whole, and we're gonna think about what the novel can teach us about the relationship between trauma, war, and masculinity. Um, but first of all, let me see if I can get to my next slide here. Um, there we go. All right, so uh, in Regeneration, we have a variety of characters responding to traumatic or horrific events um, and manifesting um, symptoms of what we would today call PTSD, or maybe more commonly is referred to as a nervous disorder or shell shock in the time of the novel. Um, but now that the chat's slowing down, we've got everybody's names in there. Um, enter, what are some symptoms of PTSD that we see happening in these, in these different characters? How is this trauma manifesting itself? So I'll just let you enter it into the chat, whatever you think of, whatever pops into your head. There's a lot of you, so I won't necessarily mention everybody's uh, options here. But yeah, I'm seeing so selective mutism, hallucinations, nightmares is kind of one of the most common ones that we see. Um, loss of memory. Let's see what else we see. Stuttering. Um, yeah, so there's a whole list. What I've got here is not an exhaustive list, but there's a variety of different symptoms we see, so many of which you mentioned in the chat. So thanks for sharing. So yeah, flashbacks, hallucinations, tons of nightmares, um, suicidal ideation. There's issues with almost every kind of uh, uh, sense, uh, sense organ, right? Um, there's vomiting, paralysis, immobility. Um, so I want to keep those in mind as we move forward and think about how trauma is actually manifesting. But for a second, let's kind of take a step back. We're not going to cover too much of the history of the study of trauma, but I do want to think a little bit about hysteria. So you should have on your screen right now uh, a painting of Jean-Martin Charcot. He's this one right here. Um, so hopefully you haven't covered this, but if so, I'll make this brief. Um, so he was a French neurologist studying hysteria in the late 19th century, um, and he began documenting his patients and their symptoms. And his treatment of them at the Salpetriere, which was a former asylum 
in Paris. He was studying hysteria. And his protégés included Pierre Genet, Sigmund Freud, William James, basically the founders of modern psychology. Um, he'd give weekly public lectures, provide live demonstrations of his patients and their symptoms. And at the time, hysteria was considered this weird, incomprehensible disease with these mysterious symptoms um, specific to women and originating in the uterus. And that's actually the etymological root for the term hysteria. And it was commonly associated with melancholia, um, but was often a catch-all for any kind of female behaviors or attitudes that were outside the realm of men's understanding or approval. So we can see a lot of these symptoms, are, this was basically another term for PTSD at the time. And so trauma and masculinity or sexuality are, are inextricably intertwined really early in its study. At the time, hysteria was commonly um, considered outside the realm of serious scientific inquiry. But Charcot, he was getting uh, a wider like professional acclaim and he began to lend credibility to that field. In general, he would approach his patients and their symptoms in the form of a taxonomist. So he wasn't really interested in their, um, their inner lives. And he believed that hysteria was a neurological disorder it had a physical origin and it was hereditary. So someone could only develop hysteria if they were a certain type of person, if they were predisposed to it. And we see, well, this continues to echo in the novel today and it even continues um, to echo in like current culture as well. So at this point, Hysteria was only really associated with women. Um, male hysteria had been acknowledged, but only in deviant men or, or men deemed deviant or aberrant um, and effeminate. <coughs> Excuse me. But eventually Charcot and his students acknowledged um, that hysteria could be brought on by an external event, something that could be as horrifying as like a railway accident. Um, so although Charcot still maintained that it would only be brought on if you had a predisposition to it. So still an external event could catalyze that predisposition, but you were still, if you had some kind of mental breakdown, um, it still meant you were a certain type of person, um, an effeminate man, a deviant man, etc. cetera. Um, so, and at the time he originally believed that hysteria was a result of shock to the spine or to the nerves. But over time, his students eventually realized that this wasn't a physical injury, it was actually a psychic one. And so the treatment needed to be psychological as well. So it's just interesting thinking about how this issue originated as something that was purely internalized and physical, a reflection purely of you and your, your, heredity, uh, your heredity. But eventually with time, it evolved to be recognized as something that could be brought on by an external event. Um, and that it was purely psychic and needed to be treated in that way. However, um, its association with effeminate or aberrant men um, lingered on. And we'll touch more on this moving forward. I'm just gonna check the chat real quick in case there's any questions. Um, okay, cool. All right, so I wanna shift gears now to think about regeneration. Um, in a 2012 interview, in The Guardian, Pat Barker mentions her absent father. She also mentions her grandfather who was wounded in combat, kind of discussing some of her motivations um, for writing this novel. Um, so I've got this passage. It was a bayonet wound, but he, Barker's grandfather, never talked about the war. So there was a wound and there was silence. But that kind of silence becomes compelling. It's a space which invites imaginative exploration. Um, I'm guessing by now, you all have already mentioned um, that trauma is literally Greek for wound, right? So we have this this sense of a wound, and also we have this sense of silence. Trauma resists language, it resists narration. Moving forward, she also mentions, I needed to write from the viewpoint of a character who was intelligent, compassionate, and well-informed, but who, like me, and like the reader, had no direct experience of the fighting in France. So I would argue that for any text or any film, typically there's a primary character we're kind of seeing through their perspective or we're sitting on their shoulder and watching the events somewhat from their perspective. Um, so maybe somebody just volunteer, put a, put a thumbs up if you wanna volunteer. Who would you argue is kind of the stand in for the audience? Who are we following? Let's see, I see something that's popping up in the chat. Okay, so somebody mentioned, thank you. So in the chat, you mentioned Rivers. Um, I would agree. I've, I've had some people previously say, say Sassoon. I would argue ultimately we are, um, following Rivers' experience, right? He's attempting to understand what's going on with these other characters. And in a similar sense, the way we're reading this novel kind of tracks along his same experience. We are looking into the nuances of this text the same way he's looking, um, using psychoanalysis to look into the nuances of their symptoms and how they talk about it. So our attempts to understand the experience of, the, of these characters kind of follows Rivers' experience as well. And ultimately the novel is 
kind of reenacting treatment in an attempt to understand. So Barker's less interested in um, depicting the actual traumatic events and more in terms of the process of recovery. Um, however, that process kind of contradicts societal norms and military norms. So I can get us to our next slide here. So um, I realize it may be hard to see because of like your Zoom controls or, or the camera, but I've got three um, quotations up here. Um, so early on in the novel, Rivers mentions he's concerned that people are going to think they're sheltering conscies or conscientious objectors, as well as cowards, shirkers, scrimshankers, and degenerates. And I think scrimshankers is one of my favorite words ever. Um, at another point, Pryor's father is basically saying he doesn't really have much sympathy for Pryor, what he's going through. And he says he'd get a damn sight more sympathy for me if he had a bullet up his arse. And then finally, Pryor himself is talking about his uh, condition and he says, you see, what I find so difficult is I don't think of myself as the kind of person who breaks down. And yet time and time again, I'm brought up hard against the facts that I did. So again, this kind of ties back to the assumptions we make about people who have these mental breakdowns or these nervous disorders or suffering PTSD or shell shock. Only certain kind of people um, do this. If you're exhibiting this behavior, it must mean you are less than. Um, so I'm curious if anybody wants to comment on any of these quotes or all of them together. I'm especially curious about looking at the quotation in the middle. Um, so I suppose you could enter it in the chat or if you wanna comment, maybe put a thumbs up and we can, you can unmute yourself and speak up. How about this, how about the quotation in the middle? What stands out to you about this middle quotation or even just something that you find strange or weird? Again, um, throw a thumbs up if you wanna volunteer or you can enter it in the chat. And I'm not afraid of uncomfortable silences. So let's see. I see somebody mentioning the violence in the statements. Yeah, in general, these are, um, especially this, this second passage, right? It's a pretty graphic statement, it's pretty specific. Um, what else? Somebody tell me more about that. Let's see, okay, I see some other stuff popping up in the chat. Let's see, his illness had to be physical in order for him to take it serious. Yeah, there's this priority over the body, over the mind, right? We can understand someone and even sympathize with someone whose body is broken, who is physically wounded, but for some reason, um, a, a mental issue is not something we understand or appreciate. Um, I see it's interesting how dismissive and cruel Pryor's father is towards him. Yeah, again, it is very dismissive, it's very cruel. Um, Pryor's father does not think mental illness is legitimate, more honorable, this creation of psychological pain is real. Yeah, these are great. Um, it's easier to sympathize with physical injuries. I saw somebody had their hand raised. Um, looks like Chelsea. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and share what you had to say? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we talked about this quote a bit last class, and we're talking about how um, there's a, a big difference in how Pryor's mom upset because Pryor has kind of crossed this um, societal boundary line into a sort of elitism as becoming an officer even though that's not where he came from and in that sense he's exhibiting betrayal to his family but also he thinks that his wife or Pryor's mom has kind of feminized him by making him into the um, joining this kind of elite role and um, so and I would also say that this quote kind of gets at some kind of um like there's definitely a lot of sexual nuances throughout the book um and like homosexual nuances and i would say this gets at that as well and obviously like we know that sassoon is homosexual and there's moments throughout the book where some characters i think graves says at the end that he was afraid that sassoon would think of him as gay and so um that kind of gets at that you know, it's bad if you're effeminate, it's, it's not manly if you're this or that um, aspect as well. Yeah, that, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, so I would definitely agree. There's a lot there to unpack about what you just said. Um, even mentioning the, oh, you're, you're entering some elite group um, points in the novel, they mention how different groups of people like, oh, certain classes or certain officers do or don't experience trauma or exhibit it as much. Um, yeah, and then going into this other issue of just homoeroticism. There's definitely, um, you know, explicit and implicit references throughout. Obviously, in the time period this is written in, you know, that's another way. A lot of times the masculine is defined in this novel in terms of 
um, its opposite or other. So what it means to not be a man. Um, so there's a lot of, in the culture, there's a lot of equation between effeminacy and homosexuality, um, both of which are deemed not manly. Um, yeah, the, the, this passage in itself, you know, um, getting shot in the behind is often played for laughs. I can think of like Boyle in uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I can think of Forrest Gump. Um, you know, it's also something that would logically only happen if you were turned away from the action. Um, but then, yeah, the, the use of that preposition up, um, it does imply, somebody just mentioned in the comments, it's, it's a specifically sexual violence, right? Um, and so somehow a physical wound would be better than a mental one. Um, and even this reference here, like, it also makes me think of the way like sexual violence against men is often like played for laughs as well. You know, somehow it's still a joke to joke about prison rape, even though it's horrific and tragic and traumatic. Um, so I think this implies that sense we can think of like, kind of going back to almost victim blaming or shaming, if you quote unquote, allow this to happen to you, you must be less of a man. Um, let's see, first brother seems to put a lot more attention or glory on physical conditions rather than mental. Yeah. Um, Moving on to this bottom quote too, I'm pretty sure y'all have read a piece by Cassell by now, if I looked at the syllabus right. Um, Eric Cassell talks about um, how one form of suffering can exacerbate another. Prior is already suffering through the various manifestations of PTSD, but the very fact that he's suffering um, exacerbates that because he thinks to himself, the fact that I'm suffering so much um, means something is wrong with me. So um, we're exacerbating it with a form of like self-loathing and shame. Um, Great. All right. So let me see if I can get my slide to progress here. In a moment, I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me, have a few uh, words up on the screen. I want everybody, if you can, once I put them up, don't censor yourself, don't think, just whatever pops into your head, it, whatever words, images, people, or characters come to mind, um, there's no wrong answer. Just enter it into the chat. I think this is a useful little uh, kind of experiment, and we'll see if it crashes and burns or not. So what comes to mind when I, when I say words like man, male, or masculine? So whatever pops into your head and then enter it in the chat and we'll see what the trends are. <clears throat> I'm gonna pause to read them so I don't actually influence um, what other people are thinking of and writing. But it looks like they're coming through pretty quickly. All right, I'll go ahead and start acknowledging some of these. So I see tough, strong, the typical soldier, violence, tough, strength, strength, assertive, large, soldier. Again, some of this based on the topics we're talking about, I suppose you're already influenced. Muscle, strong, a lot of strong, cold, that's interesting. A um, lot of strongs, fighter, emotionless, yeah, stoic. A lot of strong, a lot of power, strength, dominance, patriarchy, in charge, Superman, testosterone. I'm not going to necessarily read them all. Let me just see if there's any other. Toxic masculinity, stand up, taking responsibility, dominating, provider. All right. I don't want to accidentally ignore anybody. Okay, so this is fascinating. This went quite well, and as I predicted. Um, so we see strength, we see power, we see soldier, violent, stoic. Um, <clears throat> so I want us just to kind of pause and think about what the associ associations in our head with masculinity and the concept of masculinity, how does that result from and reflect and reveal our cultural norms? Um, and how does it then in turn reinforce those cultural norms, right? Um, I saw, you know, we're seeing issues of strength, masculine. Oh, I meant to put up mine, to be fair, I should admit. The first time I did this exercise, it's kind of embarrassing, but honestly, what popped into my head was, um, let me click so I can get it to go forward here. Um, John McClane from Die Hard, Rocky Balboa from the Rocky movies, and uh, my dad, right? I think we're also trained to naturally think of paternal figures. So, um, so we can see an interesting trend, though, a pretty straightforward trend in what everybody entered in the chat. We're, we're conditioned to think about fathers or brothers, older models, um, figures in control. I saw several people like, you know, dominant or in control, the patriarchy. Um, we can think about, you know, I saw a trend there about soldiers or fighting and stoicism. So violence, strength, and stoicism. Nobody said nurturing. Nobody said intellectual. Um, I did see provider, um, but that was like one. Um, yeah, nobody said, um, you know, uh, uh, giving, right, or generous. Um, so again, there's this notion of dominance, of lack of emotion, um, and of violence inherent in that. And we can think, too, in terms of 
how these ideas of masculinity influence the ways in which men and, and culture in general treats trauma and people who are suffering from it, um, but also potentially how it leads to trauma, right? If, if men are taught to handle, solve problems with their fists, to go into violence, to be a soldier, right? Then our notions of what it means to be a man pushes men towards actually experiencing trauma. So let's, let me go forward another slide here. Um, so I know this is a really long quote, but I think it's incredibly important. Um, so can I get a volunteer to read it? Just so I like to get a mix of voices in here. I'll look for somebody to raise there. Uh, let's see, it looks like Caitlin is willing to read it. In leading his patients to understand the, that breakdown was nothing to be ashamed of, that the horror and fear were inevitable responses to the trauma of war and were better acknowledged than repressed, that feelings of tenderness for other men were natural and right, that tears were an acceptable and helpful part of grieving. He was setting himself against the whole tenor of their upbringing. They had been trained to identify emotional oppression as the essence of manliness. Men who broke down or cried or admitted to feeling fear were sissies, weaklings, failures, not men. In advising his young patients to abandon the attempt at repression and to let themselves feel the pity and terror their war experience inevitably evoked, he was excavating the ground stood on. Nice. Thank you for reading that. And I realized the last line might have been hard to see. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to note, um, we won't talk about this too much, but um, there's a lot of imagery constantly around rivers and excavation or digging. Um, which again, I think we can tie to notions of psychoanalysis, um, as well as just the fact that we're talking about World War I, trench warfare. The soldiers are literally always surrounded by mounds of dirt. I mean, I, I, would, I would venture that Barker's doing that intentionally. Um, wh what's going on in this quote? I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward, but does anybody wanna, wanna volunteer to comment on this quote? Why do I put it up here? What stands out to you regarding masculinity in war? Let's see, uh, Jayla, yeah. Um, I'm guessing that Dr. Rivers is getting at like the idea that in society that as a man, you're supposed to be tough, you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to not cry and not really be have emotions. And he was like saying that in order for them to be able to get through what they're going through and psychologically, it would, they would have to be able to basically um, change what they previously have known of men being emotionless and not necessarily um, being as strong and vulnerable as before. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, just this idea that again, this, these cultural definitions of masculinity push men to seek out violence, violence and then be traumatized, but then also that these cultural norms of masculinity stand in the way of actually being healed. And so Rivers in this experience is, is again, trying to, trying to confront, having to confront these cultural norms um, to actually teach these men who have been taught both by society and, and in their military training as well, um, to never break, right? To be made of steel, to never um, actually admit what's going on, talk about it, um, heaven forbid, cry. Um, and again, one of the things that we're also dealing with is this notion of this self-loathing and self-shame. There's something wrong with me as a man if I'm experiencing um, these, these symptoms. Let me see. Um, I see somebody mentioned men are expected from a young age to exhibit all these qualities. Yeah, failure to do so creates a psychological toll. Um, yeah, and again, so as Cassell said, suffering, exacerbating suffering. Um, and again, yeah, so we have these hyper-masculine figures to emulate um, that nobody can ever live up to, right? Um, none of us will ever be Superman. None of us will ever be the perfect soldier. We'll talk more too about the romanticization of war and war figures and the effects it has. Um, yeah, it, somebody else mentioned Rivers' patients are trying to overcome two types of trauma, physical mental trauma of war, but then yes, the, the mental trauma of being less of a man because you're traumatized by the first. Um, great, this is all great. I wanna make sure we're staying on track for time. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump to our next quotation. Um, I'll read this one. All right, uh, the change he demanded of them and by implication of himself was not trivial. Fear, tenderness, these emotions were so despised that they could be admitted into consciousness only at the cost of redefining what it meant to be a man. Not that Rivers' treatment evolved any encouragement of weakness or effeminacy. His patients might be encouraged to acknowledge their fears, their horror of war, but they were still expected to do their duty and return to France. Um, so again, this is awfully similar to the previous passage, um, but one thing I wanna highlight um, is there's this tension here too, as 
for Rivers as a healthcare provider. He's trying to heal these soldiers of the trauma they've experienced, and he is having to confront these uh, cultural norms of war, but he's trying to heal them just so he can send them right back into it. Um, you know, so I know this thing shattered you, and I need to get you prepared just enough so we can say you're fit for duty and ready to go back and be exposed to it once again. So there's this interesting tension for a healthcare provider in this role. Um, yeah, whereas I see, you know, Rivers is confident the trauma they're experiencing is caused by war and not by weakness. Um, it looks like, uh, let's see, Lisa, it's hard for me to read from this distance. Um, so did you want to share something too? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's ironic that um, he specifically says that his treatment, um, like, doesn't it involve any encouragement of weakness or effeminacy, but that's precisely what is kind of needed to battle those feelings that like you can't cry, you can't talk about what's happened, and you have to go through a period of weakness where you're battling all of this like toxic mascul masculinity that you've been brought up in to heal from your trauma, but you can't stay in that period or River won't allow you to stay in that period of redefining that because he needs you to get over it, go back to where you were in that toxic masculinity state and go back to the war. Yeah, thank you. It's a really fascinating tension of, you know, okay, I need to let you get in touch with your feelings, but just a little bit. You know, I can't let too much weakness or effeminacy because then you, you'll be too much the other direction and not able to go back to war. And yeah, just this, this interesting notion of a really toxic environment um, that I have to kind of heal you from, but also prepare you so you can go right back to it. Um, yeah, a really nice point. Um, okay, so I wish we could linger, um, but I want to go ahead and move on. Um, so I also, you know, thinking about masculinity, we can also think about um, gender relations and gender roles and just the, the desire to build new relationships um, and how important that can be in kind of overcoming trauma, but also how, how detrimental trauma is to actually creating any new relationships, um, right? So I, I saw this meme, like, when I first did this lecture, and it just felt kind of perfect, although a bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, so let me see. I just don't want to miss anything. Um, what's going on in the chat here? Um, all right, I see some, let's see. Really a cure implies that the patient will no longer engage in behavior that is clearly self-destructive, but in present circumstances, covering the resumption of activities that were not really, yeah, but were actually suicidal. Um, let's think too, so I've got these two quotations. Um, I'll, I'll read the first one. He didn't know what much what to make of her, but then when he was out of touch with women, they seemed to have changed so much during the war to have expanded in all kinds of ways, whereas men over the same period had shrunk into a smaller and smaller space. Um, we can think of this in a, in a variety of ways in terms of the way combat kind of shakes up gender roles. Um, you know, it unfortunately takes terrible activities to actually shake up the norm and, and you know, allow women to be somewhat mobilized. Um, but at the same time, we can just think about the way traumatic events shatter one's identity and the ability to connect with anybody. Um, the second quotation, I'm guessing most of you have already read, um, basically Pryor is thinking, he's, he's dealing with this um, paradox, this contradiction. And this novel deals with trauma and so is constantly filled with these contradictions and paradoxes where I need this person to know me, right? How can you create a truly intimate relationship if somebody doesn't understand the events that have forever altered your life and that you're still dealing with? I want this person to know me, but at the same time, I can't let them know me because they're the haven. They would, they would think of me differently. Um, let me check. I see people mentioning um, he won't understand her emotions behind the abortion because he isn't a part of it. That's true. And she doesn't want him to, him to, but at the same time, he wants him to see everything and comfort her. So again, again, Cassell and, and exacerbating suffering, right? He needs to be known, but at the same time, um, he can't utter it, right? Again, trauma resists narration. It resists language. Um, and there's this desire, right? Men said that they didn't tell their women about France because they didn't want to worry them, but it was more than that. He needed her ignorance to hide in. Um, all right. So I want to, keep, let's see, reminds me of the patient actor piece in struggle with abortion. I mean, this is, these are themes that run so commonly throughout health humanities, right? This need to, how do you articulate something? How do you make a connection? Um, but then also, what do you risk in that? Um, even, even the idea of empathy, and I'm not sure if you've gotten here yet. I don't, didn't, don't remember this in the syllabus, but just the way in which healthcare providers have to protect themselves. Um, sharing information to others can be sharing a burden, but it can be burdensome to other people. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, veterans don't want to tell their story to non-soldiers because they don't think non-soldiers will, un will understand. Um, 
but they also are resistant to reach out to their old uh, like comrades in arms because uh, my own brother has said to me like, maybe he's having a good day. And if I mention that story or share it with him, it's gonna bring him down. Um, let's see, all right. Um, also think about the moment, somebody in the comments, think about the moment on the beach when Pryor feels aggressive and angry at Sarah, that she owed him something. Um, but something about the storm shatters the him versus her configuration. Yeah, there's an interesting intrusion of the natural world. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move forward. Still thinking about um, gender roles, gender relations. This is a really fascinating scene when Sarah sees these amputees in this hospital tent, kind of hidden away. Um, she saw them, a row of figures in wheelchairs, but figures that were no longer the size and shape of adult men. Trouser legs were sewn short, empty sleeves pinned to jackets. One man had lost all his limbs and his face was so drained, so pale, he seemed to have left his blood in France as well. Um, and then she has this weird moment or interesting moment where she can feel their discomfort. They're afraid that she will look at them and acknowledge their loss. They're also afraid that she won't look at them. And that somehow makes it worse that she's obviously aware of it, but refusing to acknowledge it. Um, and she realizes their discomfort that she has created. And she's kind of mad at herself in the situation. She says there was nothing she could have done that would have made it better simply by being there, by being that inconsequential, infinitely powerful. Again, these paradoxes or contradictions here. Um, infinitely powerful creature, a pretty girl. She had made everything worse. Her sense of her own helplessness, being forced to play the role of Medusa when she meant no harm, merged with the anger that she was beginning to feel at their being hidden away like that. So what do you make of these two passages? What's your reaction? What stands out to you? Whether you want to enter it in the chat or raise your hand, I'm curious to hear, oops, let me go back. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, especially in terms of the use of language. What strikes you about the, these images or these moments? Yeah, see the dis disabled men are disfigured. They're not considered handsome anymore, right? They no longer have the size and shape of adult men. They are literally disfigured. They no longer look like quote unquote normal men. I'm sure during Frankenstein, you all discuss like what it means to be a human, right? Um, she is untouched by war, but she is pretty still. Um, these men, these images um, in my mind, well, I'll, I'll bite my tongue. I see, um, we'll go back to the comments. I see Grace raised your hand. What did you have to say, Grace? Yeah, so I I really liked the language use in this passage. I thought it was really like kind of really descriptive and like beautiful and really um, explained. I think I think you know you talked about using so much like paradoxical and contradictory language, and I think it really mirrors how much dissonance she feels. Like there's no way that she could have entered the situation and it been okay because I feel like we all know that you kind of look at someone that may like be amputated and you don't want to draw too much attention to it but you also don't want to act like you're ignoring it and she's seeing all the horrors of war but she also doesn't want to make them feel bad and it's like I think it just really um does a really good job of showing that internal dissonance and conflict that she's having in that situation yeah thank you again this kind of no win situation um which you know, we could extrapolate the entire war or war in general as a no-win situation, um, but there's no appropriate response. Um, you know, I think I've, I've had this conversation with people in the past, like somebody mentioned once to me, they're like, I hold the door open for everyone who's like coming like behind me, you know, in a building. Um, but if it's somebody in a wheelchair, are they going to think I'm belittling them because they're, you know, and no, they're perfectly capable of handling themselves, but I would hold it for anybody. And then, then I just a jerk if I let the door shut in their face. Um, do I look at these amputees? Do I not? How do I acknowledge it? Um, again, they no longer fit. They literally no longer fit their uniform. They are no longer the perfect soldier. Um, I'm, I also imagine just the image of a, a young boy wearing his dad's suit, you know, with the trousers are too long and the sleeves are too long. Um, let's see what else is in the comments. Um, this a weird power dynamic has shifted. Um, again, the emphasis that she's a pretty girl versus them being disfigured. Um, yeah, they no longer fit into these uniforms. Instead, there's just these makeshift ways. Someone's mentioning how it reminded them of Frankenstein being stitched together. Um, the uniform is for someone else. Yeah, I am no longer the person this uniform was made for, which means I'm no longer me. Um, let's see. 
most of the novel men are constantly pressured to being powerful. Your dynamic has shifted. It reminds me of Pryor's quote about women expanding during the war. Yeah, men have kind of shrunk. Um, in, in this sense, quite physically, they're no longer the size of adult men. Um, we are taught to look away and ignore obvious injuries or deformities whenever we see them. But again, in a way is that, would that be read as abhorrence and disgust and, and or a refusal to acknowledge, right? No, look on my wounds, see what I've gone through. Um, there's parallelism between them, the disabled man, the pretty girl. Um, yeah, and again, I'm sure they're thinking, yeah, by their reaction might've been different if it was just uh, another man or even like a young boy or something, but they see a pretty adult woman. Um, and so they're thinking, you know, maybe I'll never have that again, or they're embarrassed almost by their wounds. Um, let's see, um, being on the edge of trauma, not being able to do anything about it, it's very similar, let me see. Sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm not, I wanna make sure I'm addressing and acknowledging everybody's comments. Um, but I think I lost my place. Here it is, uh, not being able to do anything about it. Very similar to a close friend of someone dealing with psychological illness. You don't wanna push buttons, but you also wanna acknowledge it. Yeah, really good point. Um, Sarah feels uncomfortable being the pretty girl in a room of men. She's been untouched, at least physically, not, not visually uh, touched by the war, but the, they are marked by the war. The, they are stamped with it. Um, Let's see, we're struggling with something, at least for me. Yeah, so again, do you acknowledge someone's um, struggles or do you, do you push them um, or do you ignore it? Um, I, someone mentioned the role women play in defining masculinity. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that when we define, our culture tends to treat these as binary things. So when we define one, we're inherently or implicitly kind of defining the other as well. Part of being a man is the ability to approach and talk to women. We'll talk in a bit, if we don't run out of time, about um, the right kind of love that's referenced in this novel. Um, all right, thank you all for these comments. Um, I think I've addressed everybody's. Um, yeah, and so in a way she is marked, that's true. Sarah is marked by the war because of the yellow from the munitions. I also just wanna point out the image of Medusa, the Gorgon who you know has hair of snakes and if you look on her face, you're frozen. They are literally immobilized, right? They're unsure how to react to her. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of Im immobility in this novel, thinking about trauma, um, being immobilized in a trench no, with nowhere to go. Um, that's, that's trauma. When fight or flight is insufficient, you can't run, you can't fight, you're just frozen. Um, that's when trauma manifests itself. So being frozen in stone. Um, it's also worth mentioning that in classical mythology, Medusa is um, a victim of rape. The god Poseidon rapes her and that's, she gets punished by Athena. Um, and in psychoanalysis, she's often seen as a symbol of either the fear of castration um, or uh, fear of an Oedipal desire. So the very image of Medusa is very much wrapped in ideas of masculinity, sexuality, um, and femininity, um, as well as immobility and trauma. All right, how are we doing on time? A little behind, so let's jump forward here. Let me just check the chat. Um, let's see. Yeah, soldiers are mobilized, and that means um, coming out of the trench and walking towards machine guns. Um, yeah, or even to mobilize is to, to actually be sent to the battle where you may then be immobilized, both by an injury or by just having to then wait, hurry up and wait is the common phrase. Um, we can also think about going back to the idea of these men as almost young boys um, or, or less than adult men. Um, these two passages, in some ways, the experience of these young men paralleled the experience of the very old. They looked back on intense memories and felt lonely um, because there was nobody left alive who'd been there. The habit of secrets of looking back, the inability to envisage any future seemed to be getting worse. Um, so you have men who are all your age. You know, the men, obviously this photo is not from World War I, it's from um, 2002, but uh, these men are all 18, 19 years old. So these are young men with very little real world experience going out and experiencing horrific life-changing things. Um, so they're aged beyond more than their bodies may indicate. Um, later on, Rivers is talking with Burns and he says, Rivers thought how misleading it was to say the word matured these young men. It wasn't true of his patients and it certainly wasn't true of Burns in whom a prematurely aged man and a fossilized schoolboy seemed to exist side by side. It did give him a curiously ageist quality, but maturity was hardly the word. So again, trauma leads to weird issues with temporality. Um, we're gonna kind of gloss over this next uh, slide, but in general, the idea of trauma 
of, of the past constantly interrupting one's present and also just that it shatters one's story. You create a story um, that's verbal and linear narrative of who you have been, who you are and who you're going to be. And when your identity is shattered, you can no longer envision a future um, and thus you lose hope. So there's this constant kind of intermingling or temporal confusion as well, which I think ties in with this notion of these men who aren't really men in a way, they're much older, but also much younger. All right. Um, sorry to jump forward. I want to make sure we have enough time to briefly talk about some other things. So we already mentioned homoeroticism in the novel. Um, we can think about war being, you know, described culturally as like one of the manliest of activities. And yet this manly activity takes a huge population of men, separates them from women, and puts them into very intimate um, situations. One of the paradoxes of the war, one of many, was that this most brutal of conflicts should set up a relationship between officers and men that was domestic caring. Later on, Rivers is discussing homosexuality with Sassoon, um, and he says, but it's not very likely, is it, that any movement towards greater tolerance would persist in wartime. After all, in war, you've got this enormous emphasis on love between men, comradeship, and everybody approves. But at the same time, there's always this little niggle of anxiety. Is it the right kind of love? Well, one of the ways to make sure it's the right kind is to make it crystal clear what the penalties are for the other kind. Um, so again, I, I've got stuff to say, but I'd rather hear your thoughts. Um, anybody wanna comment on these passages or just in general, this issue of, of um, the right kind of love and, and what's going on in war and combat? <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. It's worth being reminded that the same sex love between man was punishable in England by imprisonment. Yeah, I mean, so th this was more than a, a cultural taboo. This was um, literally the wrong kind with severe consequences. Um, let me see what else. Even, yeah, even lingering on into the much more current era of don't ask, don't tell. Um, again, we can think about just inherently like going to war. Um, I don't know, in my mind, like war and death and, and violence are also very tied in with sex in general, like in the sense of your, our lives are bookended by conception and birth and then death. Um, and two individuals attacking each other, uh, you know, fighting with by hand from the right angle could look a lot like sex as well. So I think there's this, we can also just think in the way in which um, violence and sex are, are very tied together. Sex is sometimes used as a form of violence, as dominance. Um, so there's a profound kind of connection between these two. Um, and this novel, you know, touches on it a little bit, just um, the issue of uh, homosexuality. And just, again, I mean, Sassoon, that's the struggle in terms of he constantly kind of returns back to this, um, this notion or the later discussions of the novel about, you know, um, getting these letters. I think this is more than hero worship. Um, all right, wow, all right. Unfortunately, I, I'd like to linger on this, but. Yeah, I was actually, Professor Threlkeel, that's actually the scene I was thinking of when I made that comment. Two people, one person slowly stabbing another, and it is almost played like this very intimate um, sex scene. Um, it's not something you should do, but killing someone is, is a profoundly intimate thing, an experience. Um, all right, so let me just check our time because I want to make sure we have time to get to a couple other things. Um, all right, I'll quickly read this quote and then I'll ask somebody to volunteer to read the one on the right. They've been mobilized into holes in the ground, so constricted they could hardly move. And the great adventure, the real life equivalent of all the stories they devoured as boys consisted of crouching in a dugout waiting to be killed. The war that had promised so much in the way of manly activity has actually delivered feminine passivity and on a scale their mothers and sisters had scarcely known. Um, somebody wanna quickly volunteer to read the other quotation. I know we're kind of getting close to the end of time. Let's see, um, two participants raised their hand, three participants. Um, I think Anais, it looks like you might've volunteered. Nope, maybe not. Guys, someone start reading. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. I can do it. Um, Rivers, it was a prolonged strain immobility and helplessness that did the damage and not the sudden shocks or bizarre horrors that the patients themselves were inclined to point to as the explanation for their condition. That would help to account 
for the greater prevalence of anxiety, neuroses, and hysterical disorders in women in peacetime, since their relatively more confined lives gave them fewer opportunities of reacting to stress in active and constructive ways. Any explanation of war neurosis must account for the fact that this apparently intensely masculine life of war and danger and hardship produced in men the same disorders that women suffered from in peace. Great, thank you. Um, so quickly, I know we're, we're running out of time here. I just wanted to point these out in terms of both thinking in terms of acute and cumulative trauma. Um, that debate between is it that sudden bizarre moment or is it uh, this long lasting imminent death? And I would argue either one is possible. Um, we're all living in an experience where death is constantly around us and we don't know when and how it will end. Um, and so in a similar manner, these people are sent to just wait in a trench. Um, but saying I, I spent six months in a trench waiting to die, how do you celebrate that? How do you, how do you put a medal on that, right? Um, it's way easier to celebrate that one glorious action or to discuss that one bizarre moment um, where something happened. But again, going back to this first paragraph, right? These, these men are raised on this idea of this great adventure, these glorious wars of the past, and then they find out this war isn't like that. And perhaps maybe those glorious wars of the past weren't as glorious either. Um, so quickly, I just want to touch on one thing and then I'll let, let us move on. Um, I had a quick tangent just thinking about military training, um, transforming a person into a tool for killing, which requires a form of mental distancing. Um, and I just wanted to kind of bring up the idea that this is very similar to medical training, right? Um, in both situations, you have a profound interaction with uh, a body, right? Think about begin cutting or a surgeon who's about to cut open a body to save a life. That doesn't look much different from a soldier with a knife or bayonet um, who's about to try to kill someone. So think about that social distancing and think about the trade-offs there. Um, uh, you'll have these slides. There are two short videos I would encourage you to watch. Um, we're not going to take the time to do that. Um, and I'll close with just let's think about the idea of being fit for duty, um, discharged to duty, right? Fitting, right? Fitting in your uniform, um, being considered fit, thinking about the dichotomy between what does it mean to be healthy or not, to be aberrant or not, to be truly a man or not, or to be fit or quote unquote normal or not. And, uh, I think we should probably wrap up unless anybody has any closing questions. I had some larger questions to leave you all with, and I'd always be happy to um, talk about this stuff further with you on your own, but I know we've only got a couple more minutes. So Professor Threlkill, should I go ahead and send everybody to breakout rooms to discuss? Yeah. Okay. I know that was a quick wrap up, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I don't want to keep anybody late. So I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, automatically generate breakout rooms. Um, let me see here. Uh, so as um, Paul Blom is doing that, I just want to remind you um, in your breakout rooms, talk about any of these concerns. If you need to leave at exactly 8.50, go ahead. But if you want to linger, please do. Thank you all. I think I just sent you everybody invites, so you should get those popping up.